Hi everyone and welcome to another Civilization 6 Gathering Storm video. So in this one I wanted to show you a few things in the late game, among them climate change mechanics, which is what we're going to talk about right now. So climate change starts to come into play around mid game when you unlock coal power plants. And if we go into the word climate, we can see that the next polar ice melt is expected on the next turn and the sea level will also increase on the next turn. And the speed of this depends on CO2 levels. If we go to CO2 tab, we can see what our contribution is and what everyone else's contribution is. So right now the total contribution is 5000, that's the total emissions. And we can see the exact breakdown down here. So our emissions are around 1000, then we got Georgia also 1000, Sweden at zero, Tomeris at less than 100, Dutch Empire at 1600, so they are the top contributor right now. We can also see the breakdown by resource, so coal is the majority, then oil and a tiny little bit from uranium. And we can see our contribution and where it's coming from. It's coming mostly from coal and that's mostly from coal power plants. So if we go into one of my cities that has a power plant, in this case an oil power plant, we can see that an oil power plant emits a moderate amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. A coal power plant emits a high amount. I think I have a coal power plant in here, so if we check that out, it's a heavy amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. There's also a uranium power plant, which is a minuscule amount. So uranium power plants are pretty much a non-factor. It should be this one. Yeah, minuscule CO2 into the atmosphere. So that's pretty much a non-factor. So what will happen on the next turn when the sea level increases is that some of the tiles will get flooded and the tiles that were previously flooded will get completely submerged. I already have a few submerged tiles because we are on phase 4, there are a total of 7 phases. And we can see where it's coming from. 2 from disaster intensity and 5 from global atmosphere. The sea levels are currently up 2 meters. And we can see that I already got some submerged tiles. And the way it works is that when you turn on the settler lens right here, you will see which tiles will get flooded when the sea levels rise. So this one will flood when the sea levels rise for the second time. You can see this right from the start of the game. So this is an important factor when settling your cities. And the way this works is that when sea levels rise, this gets flooded. And then when they rise again, if you don't do anything about it, they become completely submerged. And if you have a district on that tile, or really anything at all, it will get destroyed. So for example, this neighborhood right now, which is pillaged, will get completely destroyed when the sea levels rise again, because this tile will become submerged. And once a tile becomes submerged, it's lost permanently. You cannot get a submerged tile back. It basically turns into an ocean, into a coastal tile that you can enter with ships. So I will be able to go through here, for example, eventually, if I don't do anything about it. So what can you do about it? When you settle a coastal city, there's a building that you unlock later in the game. A flood barrier. And the thing about the flood barrier is that the cost depends on how much cost you have exactly. It's right here. And you also cannot buy it. You have to build it the hard way. If I go into the purchase tab, we cannot buy a flood barrier. That's just not a thing. You have to build it the hard way. And if you have a low production city, like this one, that's my lowest production city on the map actually. It will take a very long time. And right now it's already too late. There's no point even starting it, because it will not be done in time. If you build flood barriers, you are immune to that mechanic. So I do have a flood barrier in my capital, meaning I don't really have to worry about it here. I don't think it actually shows on this list. Uh, apparently not, but I do have a flood barrier in this city and in a few other cities. 
So that's definitely something to consider. I actually lost a theater square right here because I had it on this style exactly. Then it got submerged and not only I lost the entire theater square, I lost three great works that were inside. One thing I'm curious about is whether you can lose an entire city when a tile submerges, whether the city would be destroyed. That's something I still have to test, I'm quite curious about that one. Now, there aren't that many tiles that can get submerged. I actually expect that this is something that might get modded in the future to increase the effect. Because if we go into the weather climate, we can see that currently on the entire map there are 21 flooded coastal tiles and 20 submerged. So a total of 41 tiles have been affected, which honestly isn't that many considering this is phase 4. Then again, I haven't seen phase 7 yet, so perhaps that will be much worse. Yeah, sea level will rise 3.5 meters here. So we'll see about that. So that's the climate change, that's the short version of the climate change. It's a really interesting mechanic, I like it a lot. And in this game I actually didn't build a lot of power plants, I wanted to see whether you can slow it down or maybe avoid it. You can't really avoid it because the AI will build power plants, you can't really stop them from doing that. So I don't think there's really any point not building them yourself because you will miss out on quite a lot of production and the gain isn't really that big. You will delay it for some turns, but ultimately you will have to build flood barriers in your city. And that also makes coastal cities next to tiles that will get affected with low production really bad. If you settle a low production city that will be affected in the future, that city is kind of screwed because you will have to spend a very long time building the barriers. Or you will just have to accept the fact that the tiles around it will get flooded, like I pretty much did here. So right now, if we go into the climate panel, we can see that the polar ice melt level is at 55%, the next melt is expected in 9 turns, and the next sea level change is expected in 9 turns. I don't think any new tiles actually submerged right now. There are still 20 submerged tiles, however, now we got 38 flooded coastal tiles. So when the sea level rises again to 3 meters, then the tiles will submerge. Which means I got what? I got 9 turns to do something, and 9 turns is not enough. I think one of my cities, yeah, this one is still building a flood barrier. But that's actually kind of pointless. Yeah, this city will actually not get affected. At least not by the next increase. Perhaps it will by the one after that. So anyway, giant death robot, because I teased it a little bit. I do have a giant death robot right here, uh, somewhere. I'm actually at war with the Dutch right now, so I can put it to good use. And here's the giant death robot. So the thing about giant death robots is that they are already pretty damn strong on their own. As you can see, this one has 130 melee strength and 120 ranged strength and 3 tile attack range. But you can actually upgrade them with future era technologies. I can't show you that many because I can only see one right now, but we can see that the cybernetics can unlock enhanced mobility, which will give us plus free movement and it will allow the robot to perform a jump to cross over mountain terrain. So that's pretty damn nice. What's the downside, you might ask? The downside is that the giant death robot requires free uranium per turn as upkeep. And you get exactly free uranium from one uranium mine. So yeah, these things are expensive. Furthermore, they are not exactly cheap to build. If we look in here... Yeah, 26 turns because it's 1500 production. That's a lot of production. I actually bought that one because you can buy it, but it's exactly 4500 gold to do it. That's not cheap. That's not cheap at all. But anyway, let's hit the city here and the units. Probably better to hit units actually. 
he's not artillery. I'm not only doing this in order to capture that city, I'm doing it more so to show off the giant that robot. And one thing I haven't really mentioned much is how important strategic resources become in the late game. Oil and coal and aluminum are extremely important. I actually got really unlucky in this game because I got one aluminum just outside of my city range. And I got no oil that I can improve right now. There's one oil right here and I just finished plastic research. So I can go grab that one. But this is the only source of oil I have. At least I have uranium over here. But the thing about strategic resources is that pretty much every single unit past modern era requires strategic resource as upkeep. There are a few exceptions to that rule, but if we go to modern era, vast majority of units require oil, aluminum or coal. Even infantry right here. Infantry now requires oil. Not only to build, but also they consume one oil per turn. The battleships consume coal per turn, as you can see. Artillery consumes oil. Biplane consumes oil. The tank consumes oil, obviously. Supply units do not. The only line of units in the game that does not require strategic resources at any point of the game is the Spearman line. So that upgrades to AT crew and to modern AT later on. Modern AT is right here. So the modern AT is pretty much the strongest melee unit that doesn't require any strategic resources. And the archer line. So the machine gun does not require any strategic resources. And then we got some special units. So mostly support like the anti-air gun, but also mobile sum. The mobile sum does not require any strategic resources. And the spec ops, so the recon line, also doesn't require any strategic resources. But other than that, everything you will be building, every unit you will be building, will require strategic resource upkeep. So right now, for example, I cannot get any oil because I'm accumulating two per turn and I'm consuming 12. And this will actually give you penalties. But as you can see, I got quite unlucky with oil in this one. Strategic resources will be hugely important. It will not be enough to just take one deposit and be done with it. Take one aluminum and then you can build infinite amount of units with that. Or oil. You can't do that anymore. You need several sources. There are some policies that make it a little bit easier to get strategic resources. So if I view my policies right now, I can pay to unlock that. It's not really a big deal. We got drill manuals which can give us extra nitre and extra coal. There is one for oil, I think, but I haven't unlocked it. Yeah, there it is. In conservation of all things. We got resource management. All improved aluminum and oil resources yield one additional resource per turn. And furthermore, because we are the Ottomans, we got the Grand Bazaar, which gives plus one. So that means I should probably get a Grand Bazaar here. I do not think I have one, but I should definitely get one. Grand Bazaar is a very strong building for mid-game and late-game because of just how important strategic resources are going to be. This is one of the changes I really like, because you will actually have a lot of words for resources. You can't just take one source and be done with it. Like I said, you are going to need several. Not only for units, but also to power your cities. A lot of my cities are not powered, because I just can't power them with oil plants. I got some coal power plants, but I can't really get any more oil power plants. I just don't have enough oil. So that affects my production. It's going to be really important. Nobody ever went to war over oil, right? That's so unrealistic. So having said all that, you can buy strategic resources from the AIs. I got quite a few alliances in this game, because alliances are also more powerful now, because you get extra diplomatic favor from each alliance, and you get more from higher level alliances. Right now you can see that I got 1800 diplomatic favor, and I'm getting plus 10 from alliances, plus 3 from government, and plus 3 from suzerain. And sometimes you will have like four proposals in the World Congress. 
So right now we are having a session on the next turn. I can definitely show you that. We might have a vote for diplomatic victory points. If you want to win a diplomatic victory, you are going to need a lot of diplomatic favor. If I go to diplomacy here, you need a total of 10 diplomatic points. Right now we can see that Poland has two. I have two. Tomaris has one. So I would like to win a diplomatic victory here. But I'm not even sure if 1800 is going to be enough or not. Because you need a lot. So, here's the session. Let's see what's happening. We got four proposals total. One for a competition. Uh, that's because Sweden is in the game. So the first vote is free. I already talked about the General World Congress mechanics in one of my other videos. So let's check out these proposals. Oh, here's a really interesting one. About weapons of mass destruction. All players have their weapons of mass destruction set equal to the target players. You can get trolled really hard with this one. But we can also vote for the target player losing all of their weapons of mass destruction. I don't think I can actually see who has them. I'm pretty sure the Dutch might have them. So we could vote for them losing all of that. We can see some gossip in here. But I'm pretty sure I can't actually see whether they have nukes or not. That's the grievance log. We can see that the world currently favors us. And they will turn a blind eye to the next 18 grievances we commit against the Netherlands. 18 is not a whole lot, but if this builds up more, you can actually even take a city and get away with it. And not have anyone care about that. Yeah, so I don't think I can see who potentially has nukes. Who's the most advanced sieve in here? Uh, that would be the Dutch. Let's vote so that the Dutch will lose all of their nukes, if they have any. So we can do it like this. Then we have Migration Treaty. Plus 20% faster population growth, but minus 5 loyalty per turn in all this player's cities. Plus 5 loyalty per turn, but minus 20% population growth. Uh, let's vote for the Dutch to lose population growth. Loyalty will not really help them with anything at all. So we'll vote for them to lose population growth. And here's diplomatic victory. So if we want to secure the two points, we'll have to spend a lot. I will target myself. So, as you might know, and if you don't, in order to buy votes, you need to spend diplomatic favor, and it gets progressively more expensive. The second vote will cost you 10. The third one will cost you 20. Then 30. 40. 50. And it keeps increasing by 10. You need a total of 10 diplomatic victory points. Right now I have two. And we got 1600 still available. Let's say we can spend it down to... Yeah, like this. We'll buy nine votes. Sometimes the allies will vote for you, but you can't directly ask them. You can't just go into the diplomatic screen and let's say buy a vote from them, like you could in Civilization 5. That's not a thing. If they like you enough, they might vote for you. If not, then they won't. And obviously, the risk here is that we might spend a lot of diplomatic favor, and then someone will still win this. So if I don't win, I will lose 360 diplomatic favor for nothing. But at the same time, I need enough left to be able to buy more diplomatic victory points. So this is going to be pretty hard to balance. Let's see if 9 votes are going to be enough. They might be. And here's a world competition, which involves generating great engineer, scientist and merchant points. And here we got bronze, silver and gold rewards. This works a little bit differently than in Civilization 5. You don't have specific production-based tiers where you know for a fact you need to get this many points and you will get this reward. This is based on a percentage of the scores. So for the top 25% of the scores you get silver reward, the highest score gets gold, and the next 25 gets bronze, and so on. 
and the bottom 50% gets nothing. Alright, let's submit our vote and we'll see if we can get the diplomatic victory points. Hopefully we can. Let's find out. Yep, we got them. So let's check the exact breakdown. Here we can see that Peter voted against us. Interesting. So this is my nine votes. And no one else voted for us. So it was just me. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay then. Well, so there's the that. Atom power has changed. We got nuclear program. And here's the word sphere. That was already active, in case you're wondering. So here we can see the exact results. I got the bronze reward. The Dutch got the gold. And the bronze reward is one civic boost. So there it is. Now if I go into diplomacy, we got 4 out of 10 required diplomatic points. You can buy diplomatic favor through trading, and I've been doing that quite a lot. You will be doing a lot of trading in Gathering Storm in general, I can tell you as much. So, let's see how much damage we can do to make a nice infantry. I can reach it. Yeah, that is pretty nice damage right there. And again, you can boost giant death robots as you saw. There are several technologies which make giant death robots more powerful. We can make them really damn powerful. Uh, that was not a very good attack, but I'm not doing this in order to take that city, I'm just doing it to showcase giant death robots. So now we got Nobel Prize in Physics active. I can check the status anytime I want right here. We are currently number one, but we got 29 turns remaining. So yeah. I will grab conservation to unlock resource management. And when is the next climate change? In 8 turns, so I'll see you in 8 turns. Alright, so here it is. Now the sea level is up 3 meters, and we can see that the tiles are now submerged. These are submerged, this one is submerged, and I lost the district that was on it. So that's that. If you look at the settlers' lands, I think that's pretty much it, they will not rise any further. Let's go to the World Climate tab. So, in the world climate, it looks like the next sea level change is expected in 9 turns. We still got 18 flooded tiles. I expect they will get submerged eventually. But we are now on phase 6. There's only one more phase left. Phase 7. And in phase 7, sea level will increase 3.5 meters. So, lowland tiles will be submerged below or at 3 meters. So this is basically almost the end of it. Not that many tiles got submerged, but it was quite a few. And if you settle a city that will be affected in a major way, it could really get screwed in the late game. And this will affect some map types more than others, so Archipelago for example, will definitely be more affected by this. I wonder how bad it is in this area. Yeah, these are submerged for example, we can see that on the tooltip. Coastal lowland 2 meters submerged. Well, that's that then. A few submerged over here, from what I can see. So it will definitely depend on the map type. But it's one of the more interesting mechanics added to the late game. I like it quite a lot. It will affect settling decisions in a major way. And as you saw, the barriers are really expensive to build. So sure you can build them, but it will take a pretty long time in some cases. So that's going to be it for this video. I mostly wanted to show you how climate change mechanics work. The giant death robot was a bonus. I could probably win a diplomatic victory in this game, because as you can see, I have 1600 diplomatic favor and the AIs have like 100, 200. However, I would have to prevent anyone from winning a science victory before that happens. Because the sessions are not exactly very frequent, let's just say. And it will take a while before I'm able to get a total of 10 diplomatic points. There's a good chance someone would win a science victory before that point. They are not quite close and I can use spies to slow them down, but that would definitely be a factor. 
This was not a very good game, by the way, I was mostly just messing around with some of the new mechanics. But in any case, that's going to be it for this video. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like if you did, or a dislike if you didn't. And let me know what else you would like me to show, as far as Gathering Storm mechanics go. There are a few ideas I still have, but if there's something in particular you would like to see, then let me know in the comments. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.